Hey, Brenda. Hey, Pete. Long time no see. Yeah. Uh, I, I am recording this. So okay. just so everybody knows that the recording's on because Donna Welshmeyer is not going to be able to make it today. Okay. <clears throat> it looks like Divi's coming in too. Looks like Divi's talking. Do you get a, anything from him? I'm not hearing anything. Debbie, can you hear us? I, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. We're going to wait just uh, two more minutes because I know Diana's coming in and Ruth Meese are coming in. I just sent them a reminder, and then we'll go ahead and start. Sure. It's very. It's going to be super short today. Okay. Hey, Pete, this is Brenda. Could you ask, uh, answer me a question? Yeah. On EGT 103 from Pikes Peak, yeah. um, I know that we don't have the Module 8 content. Um, does Laura actually have access to that course shell? Can you check on um, to see if she's actually enrolled in that course? Because I want her to actually go in and look at the course. Yes, she does have access. Okay. So what's the name of that show? EGT 103 space champ space dev space SU 14. 14, okay.
<clears throat> okay, I'm going to go ahead and start um, because I said I promised you guys this was going to be very, very quick. Um, so, The agenda, Pete's going to give us a review of how Lamar is modifying their hybrid model. Um, I was wanting to get any course builds for Front Range, uh, Pikes, uh, Pikes Peak, Pueblo, Red Rocks, and I know Divi's going to give us an update on his. Um, and just, I will remind everybody so I can say that I've said it again, that all online and technology-enabled content and courses, so we're not only talking about the courses, but any online or technology enabled content under the SGA, which is the solicitation for grant application, must be in full compliance with the ADA sections 504, 508, WCAG 2.0, section 3, D6, page 31 of the attached document. Um, so I'll send that back out to everybody. Um, there was a question as to why a Word document um, that was um, put into D2L was, but not used in a hybrid course, expected to be ADA compliant. It's because it's technology enabled. So it could be anything from software that you're using, a CAD program, Pro-E, that has to be ADA, um, and I know it's behind the cart, or the, um, what learn to learn, what, uh, the, the machining program, just so I'm just very clear that anything you produce should be um, ADA compliant. Um, and Divi, if you, has MSU actually taught you how to just check a Word document for compliance? No. Okay. So we're going to, um, I'm going to show you first, it's the same kind of thing. I'm going to show you on this, this, um, PowerPoint, so I'm going to go into File, I'm going to go into Check for Issues, Check Accessibility, and it'll tell you here on the right-hand side the fact that I have a picture on slide five, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know why I have a picture, slide three, where, where is it at? Somewhere on this page, I actually have a picture that needs an ADA, um, probably the background, that needs an actual um, alt text. And then it's saying on slide three, also check the reading order. Uh -huh. So down here on slide three, there's something wrong with the actual um, reading order. Oh, this is, I bet this is what it is. Format picture, alternative text. Ah, yes, it's CCDY logo, um, the, the Creative Commons, um, CC, EY. And as you can see, as I'm changing it, everything over here is actually changing. And since I didn't put an actual, this isn't in outline format, a screen re reader would not know how to actually read this. So I'd actually have to go in and actually say this is a title, this is a subtitle, or to actually fix that, I could so I could actually just put this as, where's the paragraph? I'd actually have to put it into header and stuff like that um, so that it actually shows the fact that this isn't just a body, this is an actual header um, style. And then it'll actually be able to, re the screen reader will actually be able to read it. So that's how I would actually make that you would do the same thing for a Word document. So if I actually have a Word document, which I've been working on. Um, 
Mm, maybe this is a better way. So I have, a, I have a flyer. It looks okay, like anything on a Word document. I'd go to File, Check for Issues, Check Accessibility, and it tells me it's unable to run it because this whole thing is, is not ADA compliant. So I'd actually have to go in and recreate that. But if you were actually going to use um, my accessibility plan, it's going to come up with some issues. It's telling me I have a missing alt tag right here. So I would actually right click on it, format the object, and actually alt text is this is a chart detailing the CCCS um, WCAG 2.0 web plan. And it'll go away after I do that. And then on the warnings, um, <clears throat> we it'll tell you that it's an unclear hypertext. Instead of this whole thing, I should have said, um, and actually embedded the, oops, that's COEC website. So a screen reader would actually just read the actual word COEC website um, instead of actually using the hyperlinks because if a screen reader is actually going to say, okay, conduct an audit of COEC website, whereas with this hyperlink, it's going to have to say HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash, and by that time, you're going to lose somebody. So that's what it is. Um, and then you'll see that the heading's too long or repeated characters. It'll tell you if you're trying to actually, I have extra spaces which the computer will actually have to tell you return, return, return. Um, so you have to take those off. And then on the table, my footer, it doesn't like the reading order, but there's nothing I can do about the reading order for that. Um, but my heading is too long. For some reason it's picking up everything. So you would do, whoops, not a page break. You would do, you would actually do a um, section break. So you'd actually put in a section break and that's why, it, and that, that would take the header off as being too long. So anyway, that's the quick and dirty on how to actually use your accessibility checker in Microsoft Word to make your stuff accessible. And that's what you just have to do for um, ADA compliance. And that'll work throughout all of your classes, not necessarily for um, just CHAMP. So it's something that I'm sure your college is going to have to move to because they should be warning you that you should be creating, if you're creating a presentation or a lecture outline, um, as you're creating it, make sure that you're using the actual, um, and I think you do, but I haven't talked to you in a while. Um, if I'm typing something, and this is actually going to be my title, make sure you're using your formatting tools so that it actually is embedding that code in. And then when you save it, um, if you're printing it to PDF, oh, save as PDF, um, you're going to go ahead and choose the fact that you're saving it to PDF. And then under Options, make sure that Document Structure Tags for Accessibility is checked. And that way, when you change it into PDF, it'll be accessible. Um, same thing happens to actually, for a PDF, you run the exact same um, structure. Did you run an accessibility check and actually work on that? So that's the quick and dirty on that. Um, and if you noticed over here on this, it says how to fix it. Alternative text helps with readers understand the information. How to fix it, right click on the picture and shape. It tells you exactly how to actually fix it. So on the reading order on slide three, 
check the order, switch to the home tab, click arrange, choose set selection panel. So it tells me exactly how to fix this. So it's really pretty easy. And that's the speed uh, ADA accommodation stuff. Um, so I am going to go ahead and go back to Pete and have him give us a review of LCC, and then you can tell us how your course development is going along. Pete? Okay. Vivi, you can go ahead and tell us how your development is on your two new courses. Yeah, I was talking with my mic muted, so oh, I apologize. Well, I figured you were just ignoring me, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm halfway through, so. Um, <laughs> so at Lamar, we um, we started the process of doing the revision. So they ran their uh, first courses in a modified hybrid format this past semester. And what's a little bit unique about Lamar is that they grabbed a lot of the master courses that were developed from other colleges to help with their uh, welding program. And so uh, Doug and the faculty there were uh, adapting these master courses, kind of using the plan that we had in place. But what that did is it pointed out some challenges that they had with actually uh, running the courses in hybrid format because it's brand new to them. They had not run hybrid courses before and had not really been using a lot of the online tools. So some of the problems that they were having and that they noticed in the semester, we were tracking them and trying to figure out to make sure it run as smoothly as possible. And then upon reviewing of the course, and looking at the biggest issues that they were having, um, the main thing we were trying to figure out is if it was a design issue in terms of how we created the course and what was actually in D2L and if that was useful or not, or if it was more of an um, uh, implementation and instructional issue of trying to get up to speed on how best to use online resources and run the courses. And so that question in that real um, defining point with looking at these courses showed that it, the design of the courses that people that we had created wasn't necessarily the issue and that what Lamar is starting to work on now is a little bit more professional development and support for the faculty on how to successfully implement online instruction. And so I think it's really important as we're going through and looking um, to run the courses and to develop the courses and working with our faculty to try to figure out how much of whatever struggles that they are having, if those struggles are associated with design, we need to certainly address that immediately. But be aware that some of the struggles may be a little bit beyond our ability as instructional designers to address because it could be needing more instructional support and more faculty support from the institution itself. And uh, Brenda and I have been helping facilitate and making sure that the faculty down there are getting that support. And then as they go through and review the courses a little bit more specifically, we'll be able to see what sort of design changes we can do uh, to address some of the problems that they were having. Um, any questions about that? I know that Debbie, you have not uh, started yet running the hybrid and that's something that you're going to be um, attacking this next semester. Um, and I, I think you have a lot of resources there at Metro that can help you with um, how to actually run these online and the hybrid courses. So I think that's going to help you, but really reach out and make sure that you're getting that support, um, especially as you run them that first time. Sure. Um, Divi, is there somebody who's actually dedicated in your teaching and learning center or whatever you call it to faculty? Could, could, um, Supporting faculty who are actually moving to hybrid format? There might be. I mean, they are not in engineering program, but yes, uh, I'll check with them. You might want to touch base before you actually start your courses so that they know that this is going to be a new launch and they might um, have they might have training, especially in August for you, uh -huh. or they might actually assign, well, you know, I want you to work with this person. If you have any problems, contact so-and-so. Um, because they shouldn't just throw you out into the middle of the pool and expect you to swim because it, teaching hybrid is very, very different because you have a rhythm in your face-to-face -face course uh -huh. that you need to actually um, 
learn how to manage differently inside a hybrid course because <clears throat> what we found out at Lamar was he intellectually knew that the students were supposed to be <clears throat> doing that online portion mm -hmm. and then he was going to be doing the fa uh, the face-to-face -face por portion but the students expected some kind of connection between what they were doing online and what they were doing in the face-to-face -face por portion but the instructor had no idea how to actually make that happen okay so it wasn't. It, it was very choppy for a student because they would do the online portion and they didn't see any connection to what they were doing in their day-to-day -day class. So if they did exercises online, they didn't see how it fit in to what they were learning every day. Does that make sense? Yes. And it's a matter of that whole classroom management that uh, Pete is saying is is like in your readings you had last night. This is what you learned. We're going to apply it today. Just like a short transition or get um, bring your um, like if you have them do and I don't know anything about your courses if you design something last night we want to make sure and you hit some points that, that they should have learned in the design point last night now we're going to transfer it into the lab um, or um, something as simple as you guys did your calculations last night uh, for geometric and uh, GD and T of this part um, if you made this, I tend, people tend to make this type of mathematical error when they do that. If you've done that, this is how to actually correct that. And that way they know that whatever they did on thing, you're not actually retelling them about the problem and not having them actually work through the problem again. You're saying, usually people have this area, this is a problem, you know, if you didn't get this answer, this is where you're going wrong at, and then you can move on to something else. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. I know you probably know how to do this. It's just um, my concern is what we've experienced with um, both Red Rocks and Lamar, and I'm anticipating the same kind of issues with uh, Pikes Peak next uh, fall when they start doing theirs. So is all these CHAMP courses will be hybrid? Uh, they were proposed, uh, I would say Pikes Peak has, um, they are delivering them in hybrid format, but they are not listing them in their catalog as hybrid format because they have a lot of military people who, if they take a hybrid course, their housing subsidy gets cut. Oh. So they're just reducing the class time that the students are actually in class but they're not listing it as a hybrid course. Okay. Well, and the same problems will arise um, even with the web enhanced course. Uh, the issue that will start to happen and what was happening with um, Lamar is as they were getting overwhelmed with um, the disconnect between what was happening in the online environment and what was supposed to be happening in the shop, uh, the your natural state and tendency as an instructor is to go to what you know works best and that will start to devalue and eliminate all of the online and instruction that's there for you. So even if you're doing just the web enhance, you'll lose the impact of that web enhance if it's not integrated in the same way as a, like the hybrid. Okay. So what's the percentage like face-to-face uh, -face versus hybrid? like online I'm sorry I, I didn't understand the question can you say that again uh, like do they distribute their credit hours uh, in terms of their face-to-face -face and online and labs they distribute that way or like if it is a three credit hour class let's say we have a lab and lecture we do 1.5 1.5 1.5 be face-to-face in the lecture and the other half will be for the lab so when you do for hybrid which is part of that will be online so is there like a credit or maybe like a contact hours online, basically? Not necessarily. It should be up to Metro. Um, hybrid courses start at 30% and can go up to 70% online. So the, the online portion can range between 30% and 70%. Okay. So you have to actually follow your Metro guidelines. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's pretend you had 30%. Well, you could either take that 30% off of your um, face-to-face non-lab time 
and actually put all that material online. And so you would cut down your 1.5 hours to whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, okay, yeah. That makes sense. We, we already yeah. did that part, so we had the same thing. Uh, like one for face-to-face, -face, 0.5 for, uh, let's say, online, and the rest, 1.5 would be for labs. Oh, okay. So we made our so did you? So did you actually run it that way? We haven't run it. It has to go through okay. the program approval. Yeah, I thought you did because you had told me it wasn't going to be active until fall of 2015. I so mean, the, I was... the certificates will start from fall 2015, the official certificate. Okay. But we, for the hybrid, again, it's going through the curriculum process. Oh, and when do you think you'll get an approval for that? Uh, again, depends. Uh, but it will be fall 2016, I think, officially we could offer. But we, our instruction is already like a hybrid. We could do some, uh, because we use Blackboard, we use all our materials posted on Blackboard. For example, yes. right now what we're doing is uh, like a videos. Uh, the students have to look at the videos before they come to the class, which is like a, a video will be provided before the uh, in a week or so. So right. the discussion will be in class. So they, they won't see the video in classroom. So the, that time is online. Right. So that time should be cut out of your face-to-face -face time. Um, right. Because otherwise, these kids get you're over FTE hours. So if they do uh, 0.5 hours offline, and then you still do the whole three-hour block of time or 1.5 hours of time, then you're basically because you have to monitor that Blackboard portion. So that is considered contact hours. So if you're having them do a discussion in there, or you're having them turn in papers in there, or you're having them watch videos and you're monitoring their process, having them complete quizzes, that's considered contact hours Correct. as well. Yes. So yeah. So I think that's about it. I don't have anything else. Did you have any other questions, Pete or um, Divi? Oh, Diana's in, I guess. Yeah, I was late. <laughs> That's okay. No worries. Um, all we did was review hybrid courses. We talked about course builds. Um, and then I just reminded everybody that anything that is um, online or technology enabled, and it doesn't matter whether it's in a course or not, um, technology enabled could be you're showing a PowerPoint to a meeting. That's considered technology enabled. That would actually have to apply to ADA um, accommodations. So um, if you have any questions, just give me a call, Diana, and I can go over that. Or you can listen to the actual um, recording, because uh, I gave a quick, Divi a quick idea of how to actually check their, uh, all of his digital content for uh, accessibility. But Front Range should be ha actually having training that you attend for uh, accessibility soon. Okay. And that's it. We don't have anything else, do you? Did you find out what's going on with Skull Commons? I still cannot do anything on it. Yes. Are you actually logging in as yourself, or are you clicking a link? No, I mean, like, I was, I submitted 102, and it worked perfectly, and then I submitted, you know, create a new one, a new item, and I started describing the item, blah, 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 but then, when I went to the part where I have to, um, you know, type the course or program note and I click the add button, it, it broke, it totally broke there. And then I tried to save and exit and it totally broke in there as well. And if I log off and log in again, it just keep, it just keeps giving me, you know, that, that error. Okay, that's happened to me before, Diana, and that's what you just described in terms of logging out, then logging back in, and going back to that submission. So you go to your submissions and start clicking through the pages that you've already done. You should be able to finally get to the um, loaded up the documents, and it will uh, load those up. That's just kind of a little glitch. It's like skills comes and times out um, at some no, point. No, but it says, uh, I sent Brenda the the error that it sent me out and it's like resource not found and it's like go to scale comments at home and it doesn't even let me do that and it says that there is a java you know programming error whatever i don't know it's just really weird 
and it's just not working. It's, it's not letting me do anything. What browser are you working in? In the one that I always do, Chrome. Okay. What's your version of Chrome? The latest one, I update it every time. <laughs> okay. Uh, give me your actual um, Chrome browser uh, version, and I'll send it on up the chain. Because as it is now, you are working on which which course were you actually working on? Um, I was doing right now uh, Mac 245. And that's the one that's storing the error message? Yeah. Yeah, it's not even it's not even in there at all. Yeah, I didn't know what's going on. Yeah, so it's not even in there. Um I would say try to use a different browser and see if you get the same error message. Okay. If, if if you if you get the same error message in a different browser that's not holding your cookies, then we know the fact that it's a user, something has happened to your user profile, it's been probably corrupted. But if it actually works in a different browser, then we know it's the cookies that are still being held with Chrome. Okay. And I know with, when I'm editing web pages that if I have done a bunch of edits in Chrome, Chrome will throw error messages like that even though, and it'll mess with WordPress because it's it's retaining all those cookies and it's retaining the last version mm -hmm. um, too long. So either you have to dump your history and dump your cookies so that you can actually get a, a, a new, ver so Chrome will actually go out and pull the new information. Okay. So send me an email after you figure that out, if it, if it works in uh, Firefox. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you. Do you have anything else, guys? No, you have to go. But... <laughs> I do have to go. Um, but I will, if you guys still want to talk, I'll go ahead and switch the presenter role to Pete, and you guys can still work out issues, or we can all leave. You guys decide. I'm switching to Pete, and he's taking over. Yep, I don't have anything else. Debbie, do you have anything else? Are you... Uh... Uh, I don't have anything. I mean, um, for the CHAMP courses, uh, the certificates will be offered from fall 2015. That's official now. So we're offering the, all the new courses. Okay. We hired a two new faculties who will be starting oh, great. on this summer. Uh, they're in the tenure track position. So they'll be teaching these courses. So uh, the new courses, probably we might need some more time, like before June end, because the new faculty wants to review their, the content that I developed. They may have their own, some more inputs onto it. So probably by end of June, we'll have all those two new courses ready. I mean, the, the syllabus is ready, but the only thing is uh, the lecture content. Okay, what would be helpful with that, um, just because of our workflow that we're dealing with this summer, is the sooner you could get me, even if, if you know that it may have some edits and drafts, I could get all of the content loaded in and we can edit what's there with a new version as the new instructors get a chance to take a look at it. Okay. So if you, if you have the course um, um, material, and with the syllabus and, and the same zip file that are the files that you were uploading to Dropbox right. um, with your other courses. If you have a version and you're waiting for them to just review and edit, let's go ahead and get those to me and then I'll go ahead and create the course and we'll just know that we need to go through that another review process before you go live with it. Yeah, actually uh, we have these new machines that uh, they are trying to work on this, this, this month to develop some more lab content. So I'm still, uh, but I'm, I'm, I mean, I'll be ready by end of this month with all the content, you know, like, you know, it's just like a zip folder, you just need to upload that out to DTL. Okay. 
Yeah, so that's um, that's the only thing that would help us out on this end is just because of our workflow issues and what we have going on in July. That it, it, it gets a little tight. So the more we can do ahead of time right now, yep. the better it is. So even if you're just giving along pieces as we go, um, sure. that would be preferable than getting um, the final thing at the at the very end. Even though your courses are are well developed and what you give us is enough that we can quickly create that course, mm -hmm. um, it will just it would you would make it easier for us if you could get it ahead of time. Sure. But that's great, and you had a good trip then. A successful trip to, you went to South Korea, correct? Yes, I was there for 10 days. <laughs> Very yeah, nice. It was good, actually. Uh, we are doing some MOUs with uh, Korean universities. For oh, that's great. Program. Yeah, so it was, it was a successful tour. And Diana, then you're just having the issue with the um, right now with the skills common, so we'll try to get that going on. But everything else is going okay. Perfect. We submitted all of our courses, so now yeah, that's just, fantastic. Yeah, that is fantastic. Now it's just making switches to make it better, and that's it. <laughs> well, and that was what we were talking about at the beginning of the meeting with uh, the experience. Lamar is going through that same process with their welding program, where they ran them all last semester. Um, and so now it's dealing with how the faculty are going to be um, making those changes and making sure that that new web enhanced or hybrid format actually works for them because their tendency will be to, to dismiss anything that doesn't work and go back to what they know works, which is what they were doing before. And so um, that's, if you want to grab the meeting and look at the, and listen to that beginning recording, it kind of talks about that or I'll be willing to go offline and talk to you more about what's happening at Lamar and what strategies we're using to help those faculty run these successful hybrid courses. Yeah, I actually have a training show for our instructors and I'm doing training sessions for them. Great, that's going to help a lot because that's, I think that's what they need is a lot of the colleges don't have, they, they may have support for faculty on the hybrid, but it might not be readily available. So the more we could do to facilitate the support that they need, um, it's going to make it, the, the whole thing run a lot smoother. Yeah, I have the support of our instructional designers here at the school Good. on online learning. So they have been, like, when I'm pretty much packed up with other stuff, they help me out with that as well. Great. Great. Well, you might be able to um, uh, maybe talk to us at our next meeting uh, about some of the strategies that you guys are employing up there if you have kind of a whole team going on, because that might help some of the other IDs at the other colleges that might not have that robust of uh, support for their faculty and they might be able to get utilize some of the things that you're doing up there. So. Yeah, no, sure. Okay, great. All righty, well, uh, thanks for uh, meeting today and getting online. If you um, have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, give us a call. We are, the, the big thing is trying to make sure that we're getting, finishing up these courses, getting them published, and then it's now you know, refining the courses, so getting them ready for this fall and next spring. So, okay. Um, okay. Hope you all are doing well. You too. Bye, Pete. See ya. Bye.